Hey guys, so this is going to be a, a shorter lecture on plant chemistry. We're not going to get too in-depth here. Really, I want this as a sort of introduction to your assignment for the week, which is to find a video on a secondary plant product. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, primary and secondary products in this lecture and uh, kind of give a brief overview. That should lead us into your assignment. So let's do a quick review and then we'll get started. Okay. All right, so last lecture we looked at water and mineral nutrition and we started with water and we said, as we've kind of learned throughout the course, that water is important for photosynthesis, transporting minerals into and throughout the plant, it provides structural support and it also makes up a majority of the plant's mass. And we started by looking at the characteristics of water. We said really one of the most important things is polarity, right? Water has a positive and a negative end. And this results in some important properties. The first is cohesion. And that is that water tends to stick to, water molecules tend to stick to other water molecules, right? The positive ends form a bond with the negative ends and we refer to these as hydrogen bonds. That's cohesion. And it also results in adhesion. So water molecules will stick to other molecules. They will form these hydrogen bonds with other molecules, particularly molecules that you will find in the soil. Now, <coughs> cohesion and adhesion um, influence water movement but what also influences water movement is positive pressure, and that's like pushing water, like pushing water through a tube, or negative pressure, which is like sucking water. Let's think of like sucking water up through a straw. And osmosis, which is in which water will move from an area that has low solute concentration to an area with a high solute concentration. So all of those things together, osmosis, positive pressure, negative pressure, cohesion, adhesion, result in water, poten water potential, right? And if you put all those things together, it, it, we get this, quantum, this number of water potential, and water will move from an area of high potential to an area of low potential. <clears throat> now, we then started talking about water availability, right? So we, this is how water moves, what determines... Uh, water availability in the soil. Well, it is related to soil texture primarily, and that soil texture is a combination of sand, silt, and clay particles. And we said that the amount of water available to a plant given a particular soil type is related to field capacity, which is how much water will occupy the pore spaces in your soil, minus the wilting point, which is the point at which uh, plants can no longer take in water. Whatever water molecules are left in the soil are, are tightly adhered to soil molecules and the plant can't take them up. Now we move from there to talk about the transpiration stream. And this is the important process by which our plants take in water from the soil and moves throughout the entire plant uh, all the way up to the leaves, right? Really important process. And we said it starts by water moving into the root. And this, uh, how this works is that ions are pumped, and ions are just uh, charged molecules, are pumped into cells by active transport. And this creates a concentration gradient, that something akin to what you would see here. And as a result, water is going to flow into the root by osmosis, right? So we pump in these, these ions into our root cells, creates this concentration gradient, and water flows into our root. Now water then moves uh, into the xylem and positive pressure plays a role in this. So this water kind of gets pushed in. Let me change that. I don't know why I can't get rid of that. Okay, so it pushes water up and into the xylem. But from there, it, the, the main uh, force that is then gonna drive the water up through the plant is this transpiration stream that is starts with evaporation or transpiration of water from the leaves, right? So you go all the way up to the leaf, water is, uh, gets evaporated from those stomata. As it does, this is essentially, there's a long chain of water and it creates this chain that pulls up water from the xylem. 
and that water forms a chain through these processes of cohesion and adhesion. Okay, so that was water. <clears throat> and then we talked a little bit about elements. And we said our plants need 17 essential elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen they get from the air and water. And they are make up, uh, the, they're the most numerous in our plants. The remaining 14 elements come from the soil and we refer to those as mineral elements. And now we broke these mineral elements down into macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients, you need more of them. Our plants need more of them. And we further broke that down into primary macronutrients and secondary macronutrients. Now there was a law of minimum, which I didn't talk about here, but just because you don't need many of these micronutrients, if you are deficient in them, your plant will not grow and develop properly. Now, within our macronutrients, I talked about three important ones, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and those are primary macronutrients, right? They're the ones that most that you uh, need the most of, that plants need the most of. And then before I get into them, I did say that there's a difference between mobile and immobile nutrients. Your mobile nutrients can be translocated through the plant, right? And nitrogen... Uh, phosphorus and potassium are examples of these, right? So they can be moved throughout the plant. And as a result, if you have a deficiency in one of these, those deficiencies show up at the bottom older leaves, right? You have your plant here. It's growing. These are your older leaves down here at the bottom. These are young new leaves. Our plant needs nitrogen as part of its new leaf, but there's no more nitrogen in the soil. So it can take that nitrogen from these older leaves and use it for your new leaf. And as a result, these old leaves become deficient. All right, those are with your mobile elements. So your deficiencies will show up here. For your immobile elements, these cannot be translocated. So you have your old leaves down here and they have all the iron that they need. And all of a sudden we're no longer taking iron in from the root. So our new leaves up here are going to be deficient, all right? So it's a way of, if you have a plant deficiency of starting to identify, or nutrient deficiency, starting to identify what that nutrient deficiency may be. So that's important. And then the other important um, thing that we talked about was nitrogen, because it is um, often the most limiting nutrient, or at least you need the most of it. Right, and now nitrogen comes naturally. It is naturally found in the air, but there's not a lot of it found in the soil. What is found uh, gets converted by nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which forms a symbiotic relationship with legumes. Right, it's bacteria in the genus Rhizobia. And then you also get some nitrogen from decayed organic matter. Um, and then I briefly talked about this Haber-Bosch process which created a liquid ammonia. It fixes nitrogen in this artificial man-made process. This is what, what makes chemical fertilizers possible. And we can debate whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. And that's it. Okay, so plants have several different metabolic pathways in which they produce products that are important for their growth and survival. And we refer to these as primary metabolic pathways. And these metabolic pathways include pathways that produce carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Right? And we refer to these products as primary products or primary metabolites. Right? And if you see here, we have these core metabolic pathways, which are these primary metabolic pathways. And through that, we're not going to get into this, but through these different pathways, we have what are produced carbohydrates there, nucleic acids, amino acids, which are proteins, and lipids, which are fatty acids. So that's primary metabolism. They are producing, through primary metabolism, our plants are producing products that are deemed critical for plant growth. And development. Now we also have secondary metabolism 
and a secondary metabolism uses the products and enzymes that were produced from primary metabolism to create additional products, right? We're using these carbohydrates or amino acids or nucleic acids to produce secondary products. Now, these secondary products are not critical for plant growth and development, but they are important for plant survival, right? So they are not critical, but they're still very important. And they have a number of functions. Often they're involved in plant defense, or they can be used to provide structural support to cells, wound healing, and many others. And we have grouped these secondary plant products into three groups. Alkaloids, terpenoids, and phenolics. Now, alkaloids always contain nitrogen. And the majority of them are used to protect the plant from herbivores. And as a result, they are toxic or bitter or create a pungent uh, flavor. And we use a lot of alkaloids. So some examples are nicotine, caffeine, quinine, which is important for, uh, I believe quinine is for malaria treatment. Uh, morphine and codeine, it's derived from the opium poppy, heroin as well, and cocaine. All of these things, all of those products are secondary plant products and are alkaloids and were originally used as forms of plant defense. And then we've just adapted them for other uses, some good and bad. Now we also have terpenoids. Um, I have a picture there of the Smoky Mountains, and the, the Smoky Mountains get their name from the smoke that you see there that can be seen at different times of the day, particularly in the, I think, morning and evening. Um, fact check that, because I actually don't know if it's morning and evening. <laughs> but uh, you can see the smoke uh, coming off the mountains. Uh, that is actually a chemicals that are produced by uh, trees there, right? So that is that smoke that you see there is isoprene, which is a volatile organic chemical, um, and it's produced in such mass quantities that it produces that smoke. Uh, now, we don't know exactly what that isoprene is used for by the plants. We do know that it is increased with higher temperatures, right? So the higher the temperature, the more isoprene that is produced. It's particularly produced um, um, by the conifers that you see there. Uh, so we know higher temperatures, they produce more. It likely um, has to, it likely helps the plant deal with some stresses, particularly temperature stress, but we haven't figured it out all yet. But it's kind of an interesting fact that when they talk about the Great Smoky Mountains or the Blue Ridge Mountains, it's all a result of these plants producing this isoprene. So other terpenoids are resin and rubber, right? Common ones that we have utilized for different products that we create. Both of those, resin and rubber, are used as defense against herbivores. Remember, a lot of these secondary products are used as defense. Other terpenoids are cyanogenic glycosides. Uh, these are compounds that will form cyanide in the digestive tract of herbivores. Um, but some herbivores can utilize them. So that's a monarch butter butterfly, and it's feeding on a milkweed plant. And milkweed produces these cyanogenic glycosides. But the monarch has been able to sequester these uh, glycosides and incorporate them into its body to make them toxic to, and uh, now uses that as a defense against predators of the butterfly. So kind of neat story there. And then our last group are phenolics. These are what give plants their distinctive colors and the different colors that you see there. And flavonoids or flavonoids are types of phenolics. Um, some different examples, we have tannins. So tannins are reddish brown in color. They have a very bitter taste. They are, and they're used as an herbivore deterrent. They also help decrease bacterial growth. 
So you will find tannins in red wine. It what gives that red wine that uh, kind of distinct flavor. Uh, if you look at um, uh, streams within the Pine Barrens, uh, they'll have that uh, reddish color that you see up there. Uh, they refer to this as like cedar water. Um, what's happening is that slow moving water, the leaves are, they fall into the water and the tannins from the leaves slowly leach out and it results in that color. Acorns also have a lot of tannins. It's likely why they're not utilized as a staple food right now um, because to, you have to do a lot of processing to make acorns edible for us. Otherwise, they, they're too bitter with that tannin taste. Uh, some other types of phenolics other than our flavonoids, uh, we have lignin. Remember lignin is this important um, uh, molecule or compound that provides rigidity to cell walls, particularly our sclerenchyma tissue. And then I've also mentioned salicylic acid before. That is um, the co active component of aspirin. So it is released by the plant when the plant is attacked by a pathogen, and it's actually a chemical messenger uh, that other cells and plants can receive to start making defenses against potential pathogens. And then one more example of a kind of neat phenolic is a skunk cabbage. So a skunk cabbage is a really cool wetland plant um, that you'll find in South Jersey, probably in North Jersey too, I don't know the exact range. Oh, yeah, most likely in North Jersey. Um, a kind of interesting thing about skunk cabbage is that they can generate their own heat, which allows them to actually um, develop earlier in the spring than other plants. And they generate their own heat through these phenolic compounds. These compounds also produce a rotting odor that attracts insects. And they, those insects are the pollinators of these plants, right? If you um, fine skunk cabbage, you break a leaf, it smells gross. It smells like rotting meat. Um, but kind of an interesting plant, able to produce its own heat, lets it melt through snow in early spring. It's really cool. Um, it is an, where it is found, it's an important spring food for black bears, right? Because it pops up earlier than other plants. So, quick little lecture. Uh, I kind of just wanted to introduce plant chemistry plant metabolism uh, and kind of set up now for your videos which you're going to submit on the discussion board and we can watch and learn about different secondary plant products. So that is that. I look forward to seeing all your videos.